Jasmine, thank you so much for being back on the show. I think this is your this is your official third appearance on the show, but it's been different. It's been different. So welcome back. I feel that I should get like a bonus point. Like, oh, our most frequented guest is back. You know, it's like, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I'm here for any reason just to like, hang out extra with you. Let's do it. Oh, I love it. I love it. Okay. And so, and for those that don't watch the video of this, they're going to miss this important detail. I was intentional. I said, Jasmine always wears black. So I'm going to wear like a rosy color. Jasmine always does a side part in her hair. So I'm going to do a middle part. Then I get on and I'm looking at you. You are having like a dusty rose it's top and a middle part. Our, our souls are twins. We try not to twin. And then we try not at the exact same times. And look what happens. I know, I know. Well, the reason why I brought you back on the show is uh, so many of the episodes you've been on, you were on our One Million Download episode and you were the host and I appreciate you for that. And you also were on the Friend episode and I appreciate you for that. But one of the things that I realized is that we don't get to know like who Jasmine is. And yes, you're my sister, you are my twin, you're my family, and I love that. But there's so much more to you that I think that you would add such an amazing value to all of our listeners. You are uh, an entrepreneur and you also help people build businesses. There's so much that you do. You podcast and you're a marketer. But I think the big thing that is lost on a lot of people is yes, you help people build their businesses, but you also build lives. And I think that is the thing that I'm really excited excited to go after today. Now, um, it, for those that have listened to the show before, they know that we uh, clearly are related and that you're my twin sister. But what people might not know is that you, in the twin dynamic, there's always like an A twin and a B twin. Like one's a little bit more alpha. And Jasmine, uh, give us a little insight to maybe how it was for us growing up and your personality versus my personality. Oh, how, how was the dynamic growing up? Because people, there's, there's, there's always like an alpha twin and that was definitely your role. But what did that look like for us growing up? Because I think people need to know this about, as we talk about, as we launch into this, people might think, wow, she's bossy. Wow. She's intense. But like, I think you were form Hold on. when people say, is she, is she a little too much? I would just ask, like, am I too much like an extra fry at the end of your bag? Am I too much like winning an extra lotto ticket when you scratch that off? Am I too much like buying somebody a cup of coffee behind you? Because if that is too much, I am, I am too much and I am extra and it is ultra extra amazingness. And it's this walking around of this energy that I want everybody to, because for so long growing up, I like, I think maybe we both went through this, but it was this. I'll just say it for what it is, like a self-hate. Like we didn't learn how to even mm -hmm. like ourselves, much less love ourselves. And then mm -hmm. as we became older and as we've just done like deep diving work and as like just straight out, like in the word, like God loves us regardless of what it is we do or the decisions we make. It's like period, God loves us, period. And I actually didn't think that I actually understood the power of like what it really, really meant until I became a mom. Because there's quite honestly, and I know my daughter is three years old, but it's like, she can't do anything to make me not love her. Like she just, it's going to be impossible. I will always love her. And seeing and feeling that I now have a deeper appreciation and like, I feel fully indebted to God in a different way. And so when I look back, like I love myself now, I love myself and I want other people to love themselves because for so long I could speak for both of us. We were shackled of that. So that was a long st st way to get to a story I want to share, which is like, describe us how we were kids. This happened like, hand to heaven yesterday. So our sisters, we all just send memes and TikToks and reels in a private text thread. Now this ain't public because if my mama saw it, she'd probably faint. Like Bianca would have to rise her up like Lazarus. So we send these terrible memes and videos to each other. Bianca, They're inappropriate, wildly inappropriate, Jasmine. I mean, yes. I mean, yeah, it's just like, you know, it's like, Lord, forgive us. And so Bianca sends a video with just one word and it just says Jasmine. And when I open the video, there is um, two sisters and they're around the, like they're around like the, the, the dining room table. And one sister is teaching the other sister how to speak, like hand me the red crayon, please. And the sister's trying to do it. And the other sister is finding like, no, 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 you didn't say it right. You didn't say it right. And so finally, finally, after like 27 seconds of this girl struggling to say it right, she finally gets it out. And then the other sister says, no, you may not have the red crown. And then it was just like, all of our sisters collectively agreed that I was the sister who was pushing for, it has to be done this way. 
And then once you do it that way, I will finally give you an answer and it will likely not be the answer that you want. So yeah, like that is a hundred percent. Jasmine, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, um, there is a Spanish nickname that mom would give my sister Jasmine. And even to this day, my mom and dad still call Jasmine when she's being strong-willed, when she's being bossy pants or in her words, I'm like- not, I'm, I'm, I'm not bossy, I'm a boss, Bianca. I'm a boss, okay, Beyonce, whatever. Listen, um, the nickname, the moniker that Jasmine had as a kid, even as an adult is cabezona, which is an endearing term for big headed. Um, and I think that my parents call her cabezona because she did have a big head as a child. She legit did. I'm not being mean. How did, I hold my, how did my shoulders hold up my head? It was like, a miracle of God. Like my parents were worried that I wouldn't be able to walk. I would just like topple over. But you were a strong willed child. I was. And uh, I, it's safe to say that I wasn't. One of the things that I remember growing up as a child, like Jasmine would always stand up to my mom and dad and she would always pop off. And then I would be the number two that would come in and say, I'm sorry for both of us. I would apologize. You did nothing wrong. You did nothing wrong. But you did nothing wrong. Hello, I am Pocahontas. Let me translate what is happening here. Okay, so I say all of that because I think it's just. Wait, no, no, wait, hold on. You, you, you shared with the audience what mom and dad called me, Cabezona. We should share with the audience what they called you, Bocona Bianca, because all you did was cry. And on the podcast, <laughs> people are like, Bocona Bianca. Like, why don't we just start that hashtag? Because Bianca, like, you know, she's like, I just don't cry, I just cry. And it's like every other podcast episode, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, hold on, hold on. You know what? I can't help with my feelings. Have feelings, okay? <laughs> so yes, Tavisona, Bergona, Bianca, you guys, for all the non-Spanish speakers out there, guess what? You were gonna be bilingual by the end of this episode. But this is what I will say. This is what I will say. I, I think growing up, I would look at Jasmine and say, wow, she's just fashioned like that. She's just, whether bossy or boss, that was just Jasmine. She was always the alpha. She always had an opinion. She was very direct. Um, I remember this, uh, this is another story for another day. I might insert it as, a, as a, 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 an aside in this podcast, but remind me, dear podcast listener, to tell you about the story where Jasmine pushed a boy who was a bully at church down and broke his arm, okay? That should tell you everything about Jasmine. So no one should be surprised here when we discovered that Jasmine went to UCLA Law School, top 10 law school and jazz you had this pivot moment okay. so i think 15 law school like let's just make sure that it's let's just make sure okay. well, hold on here's my hair can you split it yeah okay great so <laughs> like lawyers on the podcast are gonna be like no it's not so it's just like let's just like you know fact check let's just fashion but yes okay so, so your entire life you have been a driver you've been a pusher uh, you have been one to stand for justice and stand against injustice. And so here you are at law school. This is the epitome of so much that you, you have worked hard for in undergrad and in high school, but then there's this pivot and that pivot leads you to a different direction. For those that don't know our story, but specifically your story, I think it's weird talking to your twin because your story is a little bit of my story, but like your story is very different when you went to law school. So can we talk uh, about this like pivot moment that led you into a whole new direction in life? So uh, my, our mom, <laughs> our mom had a relapse with brain cancer during my one L. So law school is three years. And during my first year, my mom had a relapse and it really forced me to reconcile the things that I wanted to do. That was also the first time in my life that I had struggled pretty strongly and significantly with depression. And it was then that I actually started like the unraveling of truly understanding like, who I was as a person. I was 25 years old and I started to having, like I started to make decisions on my own as an adult and pursue uh, medical care, decide if I was gonna get on medication and navigating all of those feelings while watching mom be sick with cancer was a lot. And it was at the time that I was waking up at 3.30 in the morning I would go to the gym. I would run eight miles. My hair was falling out in clumps. I would cry because mom was sick and they hated law school. But I just thought, well, this is this is how we get out. Like, this is how we move from East Los Angeles to West Los Angeles. Like, this is how our family changes. And I think that was like a lot, a lot of a story I was choosing to tell myself that was perpetually keeping me sad and disappointed and upset. So I quit law school. I moved back home. And it's at this time that you are pursuing your master's degree. So much to probably the family chagrin, we're all under the same house again. All five children. We are now, we are like, we are grown women. Like we should, for all intents and purposes, for anybody who's not Latino, people would be like, well, why didn't you just get your own apartment? And I'm like, mm, 
I'm sorry. Like <laughs> culturally, you just do that. We don't do that. Like we don't do that. We're like, dad, what do you, oh, what do you want for breakfast? Okay. You're making dinner. Okay. I'll go to the store. It's like, it becomes very, it's very tribal. And for people who don't understand it, it's, it, it sounds and probably looks very weird, but for us, it was really, really normal. And so Bianca and I are back home and Bianca at the time, you know, she's pursuing her master's. She is serving at church. She's working in the high school ministry. She is the glowing beacon of a child that every parent wants. So, I mean, here, that's just the difference. That is truly the difference between my sister and I is that like, I would give my, my parents a go. I, I would just, I don't even intend to, but it's just, I never accept things as they are. I always ask, well, why? And I think that living with another adult who's always asking why, and it's like, I'm driving my Honda Accord. I'm pinching every penny together. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. And uh, my high school sweetheart decides to propose. And Bianca was the best, best, best non-maid of honor. I didn't have a bridal party, but Bianca prepared everything. She put it in my now husband's car. He took us, to, took me to the beach, proposed. And then I was like, oh, we're going to go out to dinner. And I'm like jeans and a sweatshirt and without a manicure. So note any man of God who's about to propose, make sure that somebody in that girl's life can give your girl a main cure. And uh, Bianca had prepared all of my clothes. So we go to dinner and we plan a wedding in less than three months. And then I come back and I don't want to go back to law school. And this is the first time in my entire life, I'm 25 years old, that I'm forced to make an adult decision. What is the thing I'm intended to do? And I think it was around this time that I really started deep diving with uh, God's will and my will. And, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, I'll be very honest, Bianca, you played a big role in always like making sure that it was like foundational. Like I was rooted in making sure that like, I wasn't making a decision on my own. I was making a decision of something that God had wanted for me, which still to this day, quite honestly, a couple weeks ago, we had that exact same conversation. So I listened to your podcast and it's a great podcast, by the way. And you recently did an episode and we were talking, you guys started talking about this concept of mindset. And you said, you know, I grew up with a fixed mindset and I literally laughed out loud. I don't think you give yourself enough credit, but you had quoted a book by Dr. Carol Dweck. And as an outsider looking in, I simply thought that somebody like you was prone to success. So we can chart this back to childhood. Um, there was always something about you that was just wired to succeed and wired to achieve. So me hearing that you said that you thought that you had a fixed mindset and maybe, you, and maybe you did, maybe you really do. But um, after this, you read this book with Dr. Carol Dweck, that something changed inside of you. I think that you've taken some of her concepts and her principles and you've really just made them so easy and you put them on you put the cookies on the lower shelf for everyone to attain and understand. But will you talk about your mindset and the mindset shift that happened when you left law school and you actually pursued an entirely different business? I mean, oh, for those that don't know, you didn't mention this yet. So I'm just going to, I'm going to pepper in because I know your story. I'm going to pepper in some story, Jazz. But uh, you left and walked away from pursuing a career in law to pursue photography. And so what was your mindset and your mindset shift? that gave you the, the chutzpah, I, there's no other word in Spanish. It's ganas. That gave you the, like the, 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 the urge, urge just doesn't See, come. Hold on, like. hold on, hold on. You said in Spanish is ganas and that's the holy. So Bianca is 50% holy and I am the 50% hood of our union. And yes, I have to uh, uh, appropriately cite origins. Whenever I say 50% holy and 50% hood, Bianca's like, um, excuse me, excuse me. I said that. Okay. Give me exactly. Reference. So exactly. anyway, cited anyway, source, 50% holy, but like in this union, Bianca is definitely a 50% holy and I'm 50% hood because she's like in Spanish, it's ganas. And it's like, if you were to ask me in Spanish, I would say it's cajones. Like that's what it oh was. Oh my <laughs> gosh, Jasmine. Dad, dad's going to, dad's going to write me an email from his family <laughs> and he is going to be. He's like, going to say, Jasmine, I'm don't say that. I know. I know. And I was like, well, who taught me? Okay. Who taught me dad? Um, hold on. Before we actually go into that, and actually, I'm going to give you a little bit of time to craft that story. You are, I hate even admitting it, you are a phenomenal storyteller. You're far better storyteller than I am. I watch the way that you craft stories and narratives, and I'm like, dang, I need to sharpen my skills. So here's a little bit of time to get there. But the point in differentiation where Bianca, my own sister, my own flesh and blood, would be like, Jasmine thought she was fixed mindset. And I was like, no, no, honey. I actually read the book, a thousand percent fixed mindset. Now, mm. it doesn't mean that people with fixed mindset don't win or not successful. 
People with fixed mindset have a tendency to play games they know they can win. Mm. So my life, I was looking at what was possible instead of looking at everything is possible. When you have a growth mindset, you believe that anything is possible. Whether or not it's likely is a different conversation, but it's just the way that you look at the world. And it was the minute that I actually shifted from not thinking, well, what is possible for me? It's that anything is possible. And do we have the audacity and the faith and the hope to actually believe that that is in fact the case? And so the minute I started like honing, and this has been years, I, I read this book, my, my God, like maybe like six years ago now, like six or seven years ago. And it's probably taken that amount of time for me to literally rewire my brain. Our brain can be rewired. It is taking me that long to go from what I think is possible to I firmly believe anything is possible. And that's the point of differentiation. And that's the thing I really want to clarify. So I think since we're talking about clarification, I think this is a great place uh, where we are speaking the same language because in a second, I'm going to tell people that you gave me that book. But uh, before you have the language to articulate like mindset and that sort of stuff, can we just make this really plain? When we talk about mindset, whether as we're starting a business or we're parenting or we're starting a church or we're stepping into a new position at work, when we talk about mindset, can you make that very plain and then kind of go into what you know about fixed mindset versus a growth mindset and define that because that's going to determine the rest of our conversation. Yeah. And I just, I like on a very personal level, like, thank you for this because this is not even like what it is I do. And I believe that you are asking me on this podcast because you've seen a change in me and you see that it's like an active discipline. And so what I'm about to share is how I've made it real for me, but I am in no way, shape or form, uh, like, I don't even know, can you be licensed or I don't have any fancy letters after my name. I'm just going to kind of break it down the best way I know how. And so we all have brains and the brain is a powerful, powerful muscle. And the brain has a tendency to find patterns because patterns keep us safe. This goes back to early, like our great, great, great ancestors were always trying to find patterns that would keep them safe from imminent danger, fire, being eaten or mauled by a lion. And so what happens is as the brain finds patterns, we have a tendency to stick in the pattern, but also repeat things that we often say to ourselves. And we repeat them so much that we are no longer actually digesting what it is they mean. They become a belief. We no longer digest what they mean. It becomes a belief. I'm slow. I'm poor. I don't learn things fast. And you just take it as a fact instead of ever challenging that belief. So what our mind is, and this is the way, the best way that I know how to describe it. Your brain is a powerful stallion of a horse and your mind, if you channel your mind is the jockey to the horse, the jockey can move the horse where it wants to go. But without activating your jockey, the horse runs wild. And so forever, I would tell myself things that I am slow, that I am behind, that I don't know how to do that. And I just took it as fact. Like you and I, we both didn't learn to read until we were like 11, 12, right? Uh, we were both wildly overweight. We struggled with obesity. And so we're just like, well, this is how we are. We just took it as fact instead of saying, well, actually it's a choice and it's a decision. And as a God-given elevated creature, I can change the decision. I could stop eating. I could exercise, I'm sorry. I could stop eating at excess and I could find a way to exercise and anything I don't know, I could learn. So whenever we talk about mindset, all I'm trying to do is empower the jockey, empower the jockey. The stronger the jockey becomes, the more in control the horse goes. And a horse going 100 miles an hour in a bunch of different directions does not get to a destination as fast as a horse who's going 100 miles, direct, 100 miles an hour in one direction. Okay, so um, in I, I love how you're good, talking about the brain and the mind and the power of a horse and a jockey. So now that we've kind of like set this foundation, um, when we talk about fixed mindset, when we talk about growth mindset, how do you know if you have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset? Well, I, I, Dr. Carol DeWick, like she goes into this, like she goes into this and she uses the most powerful examples. A couple examples that stick at the top of my head was because I quickly identified with them is um, oftentimes children with fixed mindsets. And here's, here's something is we are born with a fixed or growth mindset, 
but one is not worse than the other. It's our cognizance. It's our awareness of where we are and in constant improvement of that. But oftentimes what they notice with children who uh, fixed mindset is if they lose a game, they want to topple the board. Or if, if, when they uh, learn about a, a new game, a problem solving, a puzzle, if they look at it and they assess, oh, no, I'm not going to get this, they don't even start. And so how it parlays into adulthood is um, it's now manifest, it's disguised. So fixed mindset is disguised by a sneaky fool of a fellow called self-doubt. And self-doubt, you know, there's three types of self-doubt, and I studied under an amazing person by the name of Shade Sarai, and she breaks down self-doubt into three main categories. And, and, and the first one is going to be really focused on you're the over-planner. You think about everything that could go wrong, and then you list it all, and then you say, oh, I'm not even going to start. I'm so glad I avoided that. Whew. The second type of sneaky self-doubt is treading water. These are the people who love to start things, and they have a really hard time finishing them. And the third is destination obsessed. And this is a form of sneaky self-doubt because it's like there is never enough. You say you're going to hit a goal and then you hit it and you're mm -hmm. like, no, 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 I didn't want to do that. I actually want to do this plus 20%. And so it's, you're always beating yourself up because you're never getting to where you want to go except for the fact that you keep on moving the goalpost. And so what we have to do is really understand that everybody, everybody, the best politicians, sports, athletes, Olympians, actors, famous people, everybody struggles with self-doubt. It's when we understand the type of self-doubt that we struggle with that we can then apply a different story and narrative to that. So uh, a fixed mindset when it comes to, let's just say, starting a church, starting a business, deciding to run a marathon. Well, in each of these situations, well, that first person is going to say like, well, I could break my ankle. I can go bankrupt. Oh, nobody would come to my church. Whew, so glad I'm not doing those things. The second person, well, let me just start running the marathon and I'm going to run. And then you work up to two miles and you're like, I can never get to 21.5. Just going to stop. Like all the other things. You start with the Bible study and then you get frustrated that only 10 people are coming when you really imagine that there'll be 200 people coming. And the destination obsessed is like you're training for a marathon and you complete the marathon and you're like, you want to know what? This is like a local marathon. I'm only going to run a marathon in New York City because that's the only time that it matters. And then you get to New York City and then you're like, actually, it was the Iron Man. I was supposed to do the Iron Man. So in all of these situations, what we need to say is everything we're going through is preparing us for the thing we want and the person we're supposed to become. Okay. So I want to pause and I want to breathe because this is a lot of information and someone oh. out there. No, it's so good. I mean, this is Jasmine. When I say that you help people, you know, change their businesses, I'm going to just, I'm going to tell myself for a second. When I say that you help people change their lives, you literally, uh, you're seven years into kind of processing our mindsets and, and helping people along the way, but you called me out on this. And I think I know for a, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I have fixed mindset 1000% because I'm just kind of in this as a Christian, if we speak about sovereignty, which is the con complete sovereign control of God that he has over our lives, I'm just like, well, it's his will. Kesara, sara, it is what it is. So for someone out there that just feels like, oh, this is my lot in life. What do you say to that person? And the reason why I'm talking to you about this is because because of daddy, daddy's a, a preacher and a pastor. We He's taught through the book of the Bible, gosh, I think over 16 times, line by line, chapter by chapter and book by book. We have been rooted in the word of God where we believe in the sovereignty of God, that he is in control of all. But at the same time, do we just acquiesce and throw up our hands and say, this is my lot in life for the business person out there, for the stay at home mom, for the student that just feels like, well, this is it. What do you tell them? Oh, girl, I'm going to get to second base in Bible baseball because I'm about to bring up the parable of the, I, I, I now, I look at me, look at pride comes for a, a fall because my mind just went dumb blank. The parable of the temple. What would you like me to tell you, Jasmine? Because no, no, as a Bible I scholar. Bianca, I will, I refuse. I refuse. I'm just, I'm going to flail here for a second because the word will come to me. No, it's the parable of the talents where the servant, I mean, where the master leaves three servants and they all have uh, talents. One servant hides the talents. Another servant puts the talents away and saves them and gets interest. And the third invests the talents and gets back more than the master had left him. In each of those, all three of the servants had the ability to say, oh, it's the master sovereignty. I have my 10 talents. We were all given the same thing. There are other people who will be taking the same thing that you have been given. There are other single mothers 
There are other men who have been cheated on. There are other students who didn't get into the school that they wanted to get into. There are other entrepreneurs who have failed. And guess what? Statistically, you're, there's a 75% chance that a business owner will fail in the first three years of their business. The odds are stacked against you. Never mind the fact for black and brown women. The success rate for a black or brown female founder is less than 2%. If you've made it past that three, that that three-year mark, if you've made it past a million dollars, guess what, boo-boo? You are on the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. So let us all just understand the reality. We have all been given the same thing. There has been somebody who is doing more with less. It is the parable of the talents, and we can mm. choose to say, am I going to take some risks? Am I going to try to work within my domain? And I don't think the parable was ever to focus on the servant who went and multiplied it. It was the, the differences between the servant, the second servant who saved it and got interest, like that servant did the best he or she could with what they knew. I look at that servant as dad and mom. They did the best they could. And do I think that there's friction, generational friction, like mom and dad, you could have done this or why don't you do this? And all of a sudden I realized, well, God has made us the third servant, not to save and, 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 and dwell with what we simply knew, but to build and create leveraging on the history and the forerunners of God before us. So Jasmine, I'm going I'm to call you Bishop in a second. Hallelujah. <laughs> Church. I mean, <laughs> this is what I'm talking about, Jasmine. It's just like you push and you prod and you have this amazing ability to tell people like it isn't what it is. It can be something different. And so much of this is rooted in mindset. I am very excited. You were doing actually a mastermind that I'm already signed up for. I'm very excited about this. But for, for someone out there now who is saying, okay, well, how do I begin to change my mindset? Where do we begin? This feels, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, when you said you've got thinking, thinking, you got to change your mind. Like, how are you talking about it? How are you framing it? This, and this was, um, I, I vividly remember it was in 2020, the first time that we had this really hard conversation and, uh, you called me out right there. This is a perfect example of how you change your mindset. Perfect example. What we said, and we say, so you and I, we, we, we said, well, you and I used to say it all the time. And you continue to say it, but I'm making active decisions to believe there is no such thing as a hard conversation. There is a conversation that I can apply a label to. And if my sister so chooses to apply the label of hard, or I apply the label of learning, it's the same conversation. I'm, I'm changing my language right here, family. Okay, everyone listen. I listen. Okay, okay. I had a life-changing conversation with my sister. <laughs> Better, better to get my, how's my mindset, Jazz? Yeah. It's already there. It's already there. It's already there. Uh, this conversation was back in 2020 and you just started really calling me out on uh, my mindset, the words that I was choosing to say and what I ultimately believed. And I think for somebody out there where we're thinking like, how do I begin to change my mindset? Give me the building blocks. Like, I want to make it so plain for someone out there. Give me a one, two, three, okay, give me a five step. Three ways, um, whatever. Everybody, everybody learns different. I can only talk about my experience because I was learning about mindset as like a concept. Like, oh, that's something I need to do. Like, that sounds great. Yes, yes. And the story I told myself was like, well, I just can't change my mind. Like, it's not like I'm having a bad day. I'm just going to say I'm having a good day. Like, it didn't work that way. And it wasn't until I heard this example, an analogy, uh, by my personal business coach. And at the time, his name, or his name is James Wedmore and we were working together at the time. And he had said that every time we engage with a person, a thing, a situation every day in our lives, that we are looking at a particular situation and we can envision a green sticker and we call that a lesson. And we see a black sticker and we call that a failure. He's like, Tell me anything that has happened to you in this year that you call a failure and you're choosing to apply the black sticker instead of applying the green sticker. And all of a sudden, everything that I, so um, having a conversation with a teammate who we had to let go from our team, I would have said I failed, it was terrible, I suck, I messed up. This was a massive mistake. Those were all black stickers. Or I could say, I'm learning how to become a better leader. I'm defending the culture of this organization. 
I didn't know what I didn't know. And now I'm stronger. Mm. If I miss, if I misrepresent or I say something in a conversation with a friend and I really feel like I've offended them and they tell me that I can apply the black sticker and say, I'm terrible. I suck. What if I haven't learned? Why am I repeating the same things over again? Or I can apply the green sticker and say, you're one step closer to finding how not to do this again. That you, you should be thankful that you have a friend in your life who will actually tell you that you hurt their feelings, a green sticker. Every time there is a situation, because everything we experience is a story. And excuse me, everything we experience is a situation. And then we get to apply a story. Now, if you, I mean, we're just, this is your podcast going to be real, real, real. It's like, I, I kind of started pressing very hard with my sister Bianca in 2020 because she was at a very, very hard time uh, mm -hmm. with, with the church. And it's very clear that, her, that Matthew and Bianca were called by God to start a church. So why in 2020 does the whole world shut down? And why when they're renting this ghetto fabulous, like <laughs> Baisa, Mariachi, Corazon, Indian curry next door in part-time dance club fusion, whatever. Like why does this person decide to go bankrupt, collect their money, and then the bank seizes the building or that they can't even get in? I'm, I'm probably ruining all the stories, right? There's all of these things that are happening in 2020 mm -hmm. and Bianca is just like, we, mu we must be doing something wrong. This bad thing happened. They broke into, so my, uh, the TFHOC had like a truck and it was always vandalized and it was always broken into. And so we can apply a black sticker and say, we're so, you know, it sucks. Our church isn't a truck. How terrible. And I was like, uh, let us not forget that the Israelites carried the ark. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's that. Okay. So you have nothing to hold that to. And like, there's vandalism and you could say, oh, we're so like, we should have put it behind the gate. We should have had it along with all these things. Or you could just say, and this is the hard part. We've learning, we're learning something. We're being challenged. We're getting better. This is calling us to prove how bad we want to build. It's hard. It's hard applying a different story to the same situation. But what we get on the back end is abundance, is gratitude, is purpose, is just, a, you're just a better, you, your, your energy is better. People look at you and you smile and all of a sudden people are called into that and they say, that person must have everything. You're like, no, actually we ain't got a church. Everything we had, we done robbed. There was a weave out in the parking lot. There no, was, Ham, Ham. No, it was in, in the green room. In the, in the green, green room. A weave. Yes. The green room and Bianca's like, oh, hold on, we wash it, clip it in my hair. We all oh, come on. The shade. Come on, come <laughs> on, come on. Y'all know one week to the next, the Holy Ghost just done doubled and multiplied your hair. You, oh, she's coming for me. She's coming for me. Don't hurt, <laughs> don't hurt. Okay, all this is coming out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I cannot. But I cannot. you're not. <laughs> I cannot make fun of a woman with God. Look at God taking away my voice. Look at that. Look at that. Woo! Being struck down. No, um, but it is quite honestly, if there is just something, that is just one thing that somebody walks away from, it's applying a different story yeah. to the same situation. To the same, same situation. I love that. Okay, as we wrap this up, there's someone that's going to be um, motivated, and I'm going to ask you for some resources or pointing in the right direction. But for right now, I need someone to hold on to that when the moment that you say, I want to change my mindset, I want to change the words that I'm saying, I want to write a different story. And I was actually, that that's a great mantra. You kept on saying, write a different story, Bianca. I would come to you and tell you like, I can't believe this happened. Write a different story. Write a different story. It has saved me so much heartache so much pain uh, and wisdom is walking. No, 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 I get to, and I'm a, I'm an author. I'm a writer by trade. I know the power of story. Cause you're, you're, I'm sorry. I totally killed your role. You were building it up. You had that very much like very strong Obama, like leading like I was then. And then I was then. And then oh, you're go ahead. I, go I, ahead. I totally jumped in it. But I totally jumped in. One thing you had said was like, I get to, and I'm like, let's pause there. Cause this is like a really great takeaway for people that have actionable tools is that the thing that we were raised to say, was like, well, I have to go to school and I have to go to work and I have to go to church and I have to go. And it's like the simple change of, I get to mm -hmm. same situation, but you're now functioning that your words are empowering. I get to go to work. That is a privilege, honey. That is a luxury. 
I absolutely go to so church. would you give me an A plus on my growth? Mindset, Jasmine, can I please get a gold star? Because you know, us homeschool kid, kids love to, uh, oh, oh my God, no, I, you can't give me a gold star because look at me being destination obsessed. <gasps> oh my gosh, I'm already learning so much, Jasmine. Okay, as we wrap this up, we just need to call this out because if you were talking to Matthew Oldhoff, he would be like, yeah, B, I'll give you a gold star. No, because that man, no, Jasmine, no, I I'm gonna tell the truth and shame the devil. He hates giving me gold stars. He's like, why are you so obsessed with gold stars? I'm like, because he, he, okay, so we need to clarify. He hates giving you gold stars, Bianca, but when you pester him and then you get really belligerent and sad, like, I just, I just don't, Matthew, why though? Why won't you get, and then all of a sudden, homeboy will be at Staples buying gold stars and be like, dude, <laughs> I bring you And you're like, no, 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 Rosie Perez, I want you. To look at me and say, I too, I too, no, like, feels like, I want a gold cool. star. <laughs> yes. Like, okay. Okay. But it's changing, it's changing that. And one more, and one more tool before, before we, we like that, that lead up that you were leading to. And I'm so sorry, but I'm like, oh, I got to stop is I get to, and then adding yet to any sentence that felt Honey. or sounds limiting. I don't Honey. know yet. I can't go yet. Yes. I don't know how yet. yet. What happens is that we leave space for the possibility because we went from what is possible for me to anything is possible. And by adding yet, it becomes a game changer. So when we understand that there is a horse that is our mind and a jockey that, excuse me, a horse that is our brain and a mind that is the jockey. And then when we get to choose the story that we apply to the same situation. And then when we get to say, I get to, I don't have to. And when we say adding yet to, I don't know how, I can't, I won't yet. All of these things start channeling to our brain. The jockey is there channeling to the horse, the direction to go. I need our listeners to know that there will be barriers that they will have to overcome in changing our mind to get rid of stinking thinking. What are the barriers that people are going to have to overcome in changing their mind? Well, the first one, the first one is that contrary to our mother's distillation in our belief and telling us that we were all special snowflakes, we're not. Like, we're not. That life the way that God has created life is the disparity between two points. The reason we feel sadness is so that we feel the, the truest, pure sense of happiness. Mm. The reason why there is the darkest of night is so that we wildly appreciate the brightness of dawn. And so when we look at like, oh, it's going to be hard. Guess what, baby? If you decide to run a marathon or you decide to sit on the couch, both are hard. You decide to work on your marriage or just let it fizzle out. Both of those are hard. So choose your hard. Mm. All I'm proposing is that you choose the hard of change instead of the hard of stasis because there is an opportunity cost. Like everyone's like, yeah, but how much time is it going to take me to change? Well, let me ask you this. How much time did you lose by being at the same place next year? I just feel like we've all mm. been called, like we have all been put on this earth. Like God has put something in you and for you. And yet if you don't decide to get uncomfortable and you don't decide to change and you don't decide to climb over hurdles and instead you want to play small, that you're not robbing yourself or your family or your future generations. You're robbing God of the true purpose that you've been put on this earth to do. So all I'm simply saying is, yeah, it's going to be hard, but choose your heart. So what is there to expect is that the minute you decide to change your language, people in your family would be like, why are you speaking weird? And you're like, uh, uh, I don't know. I'm just like, I'm just trying something new. And then when you decide to do something that is radically changing your life, that is different than the status quo of the people around you, it is very, very, very common for people to want to pull you down. They don't mm. think they're pulling you down. What mm. they believe is that they're keeping you safe. And so what is to become expected is people are going to have an opinion, but they're going to have an opinion either way. And what you can expect is that people are going to hold you down, not because they don't love you, but because they want to keep you safe. And then you can expect that the minute you become cognizant of the negativity that you are subconsciously speaking to yourself, the more it's going to rear its ugly head to cause you to doubt. Anytime you want to change, you will feel the pressure. Now, different beliefs for different people, but we would simply say the minute you decide to change and be a force of good, you will feel a force of something trying to challenge you and keep you where you are. So that's what's coming. But guess what? All of that's coming if you decide to change or not. Or not. So why not choose to change? 
This is a perfect way to wrap up the show. 